We have a guest today to talk about this very issue. She is Christina Sintun Ramirez. She is the executive director and president of Next Gen America, the largest organization in this country focused on youth voter mobilization, right? Turnout, mobilization, yeah. engagement, all those things. Christina, thank you so much for joining us. Thanks for having me. So the, the big question, uh, when we looked at Joe Biden's approval ratings and, and how he sort of declined precipitously since the 2020 election, if you were to dig into the, the cross tabs of those polls, youth voters actually led the way. And so there was sort of this growing fear or, or, or um, realization that, well, nobody's paying attention to these issues that are important to young voters. Uh, they were promised the moon during the election. Nothing happened, particularly um, relating to to uh, college debt relief, but also on climate action. And um, there has been progress. And so do you see a shift in that community or should we still be worried about the youth turnout this November? Well, I always think we should be focused on turnout, especially in a midterm, but you know, you talked about how polls have burned us in the past and polls for me are like an indicator, but we're living in such a rapidly changing political climate. If you asked me three months ago what was going to happen, it would look very different than it does today. And even three months before that, we did two polls. Next Gen did these big youth voter polls. And in the springtime, we saw still youth voter turnout was going to be high, uh, but this was pre the Dobbs decision. But we also saw high mo motivation against amongst young Republicans. Of course, most young voters are progressive, overwhelmingly progressive. Biden um, in some polls, you know, won uh, uh, like 66 percent of the youth vote in 2020, the highest youth voter turnout in American history. Um, but post row, we are actually seeing a huge surge in registration, especially amongst young women and likely Democrats. Um, youth voter turnout is expected to be on par with the 2018 historic youth voter turnout for a midterm. Um, and again, that like huge surge in young women registering, I think, should be sending some alarm bells to Republicans. And I can tell you, uh, I was on some campuses here in Texas just last week in Houston, and how many young women, I was on Texas Southern University, it's a historically black col college, one of the largest in the country, how many young women were coming up and saying, I'm registering because I feel like my life depends on it. Young black women registering for the first time. Wow. Wow. You know, um, this is something I quoted uh, last week, but I want to quote it again because I think it's really significant. And, um, you know, uh, Tom Bonier is, uh, or Bonier, 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 I don't know. Bonier. Anyway, Bonier. but he's maybe Bonier. <laughs> We we have we don't know, but but anyway, we're gonna we're gonna talk about him anyway. <laughs> anyway, he's you know he's from Target Smart. He's he founded Target Smart. It's a it's a data analyst firm, and they've been doing a lot a, a big look at you know um, how much uh, registration among women and other demographics have gone up. And he was saying he was looking at the um, the vote in Kansas where they turned back that referendum, the constitutional amendment that would have. Uh, uh, banned abortion in the state. And it was, it was during a, it was during a primary vote. Right. And he said, he looked back at the, um, at voter turnout and found that more voters under 30 voted in that primary, you know, referendum than voted in the 2018 general election in Kansas. I mean, that is wild because as you said, the 2018 turnout for those midterms among youth voters was already historic. Yeah. So that was a good year. But to think that there were more voters that turned out, um, more youth voters that turned out in this, in a primary, you know, that also had this constitutional uh, amendment on the ballot, right? Um, that is just wild, wild to me. Yeah. I mean, you, you, I can't think of another time in the time that I've been doing po politics and organizing that something like that has happened. There is just so many more people focus on the election. One of the polls that we did also passed after the Roe decision, you know, the overturning of Roe is overwhelmingly unpopular across the country. But when you talk about young voters, 76% of young voters were opposed to overturning Roe. When you talk about young women, you're talking close to 82% opposed to overturning Roe. Um, and so two in three of the young people we surveyed said they feel like abortion is on the ballot this election. There was never a question, were young people going to go over to the Republican side? Overwhelmingly, young people are still progressive. But, you know, I always remind people to, even when Joe Biden's approval ratings really low, were really low, 
Joe Biden was never the youth vote candidate. That was the other really old guy in the race. <laughs> was the youth vote candidate. And so, but they, they came out and voted overwhelmingly in opposition to fascism, right? And for progressive policy. And when Democrats weren't winning on progressive policy, the question was, are they going to stay home? Well, now they see fascism is on the ballot again. Um, we have Republican legislators that are, it feels like trying to take our country backwards, take our rights away. And Democrats got some really important things done over the summer. They passed historic gun safety legislation, which young people have pushed for. They passed climate legislation, the largest investment ever by any nation, not everything we need, but that was won in large part because of young people and student debt cancellation also won by young people. So now young people feel like there's something to go vote against and something to vote for. So you said that you had a poll three months ago and presumably you have a more recent poll. Have you, have you actually looked at that youth vote since the, uh, since the student debt relief, since the passage of the uh, Inflation Reduction Act and the climate change provisions? Have you, do you have data that shows that the, the passage of that legislation has actually moved numbers in, or at least uh, excitement and engagement? I mean, I can tell you from all of our organizers on the ground, we're on 186 college campuses in eight states. All of our organizers are hearing about how young people are really glad that this legislation was passed and how it's motivating them to feel like something can actually change for the better in their lives. Our poll, sadly, was done the week, the, uh, the, no. finalized the week the Inflation Reduction Act actually went forward. I was like, no! Yeah. <laughs> that was from all of the folks that we're hearing from on the ground that people realize, again, like it's about legislators that want to take our country backwards or building a future that actually is for all of us. And I think a lot of young people also understand that abortion was just the opening salvo that they're coming for contraception, that they're coming for the rights of the LGBTQ community, issues that young people and uh, overwhelmingly support. And so I think that people understand just how critical this midterm election is. Let me just, I, I'm just gonna go ahead and uh, since you sadly were in the field when some of these things happened, had student loan um, cancellation happened, student debt cancellation happened no, student yet? student loan cancellation happened after the IRA. So that was- Rough go, <laughs> rough go, Christina, rough go. Well, I tell you what, let me <laughs> let me go ahead and quote something here. Cause this, I mean, this, he, he didn't give numbers but this is good anecdotal information from uh, Bill Mc, uh, McInturf who is a partner at Public Opinion Strategies, and he does the polling for NBC News. He told Roll Call last week that he thought that, um, that the student loan forgiveness was really being underrated. Everybody in terms of um, talking about motivating the youth vote was talking about abortion. But he said, um, quote, quote, that's where I think the student loan thing is underrecognized. Um, and he said it was hugely popular among uh, well-educated voters ages 18 to 34, a select group of well-educated voters, eight, th eight group, uh, sorry, eight, 18 to 34. They loved it, he said. They were kind of, so they were kind of um, soft Democrats. These were people who said they didn't want to vote. And guess what happened? These are the people who moved the most on Biden's job approval. So, I mean, mm -hmm. that tells you something about what that did for some people's enthusiasm. I mean, I, it sounds like he doesn't know, you know, people aren't good predictors of, I'm definitely going to go vote. You don't know for sure. Um, but they were super enthused by that, um, by that, uh, move by the Biden administration. I mean, I can't, I live in Texas, right? Um, half of all Latinos across the country saw their student debt wiped away. I mean, that is just like transformative for low income communities, folks that had Pell Grants. It, it really, it took a big dent. I know so many young people, I think uh, this one woman uh, that works with us, Shelly, she lives in Houston. She grew up in foster care, but she had quite hefty student debt loan. And she's like, I feel like I can get married. I can buy a house. Like this has changed my yeah, life. Yeah. And yeah, so yeah. um, I think this is a generation that's seen honestly like a, a big stalemate in Congress and at the federal level of inaction. And they just saw in a very short time period, action after action. Um, and so I think it's making people believe that yes, government can make my life better. And ultimately it's up to me to make sure that it's the right people in elected office. And I also just want to remind the young people that I work with, I'm like a grandma millennial, so I'm at the 40s. <laughs> so I remember the Democratic Party of the 90s that was, in my mind, not on the right issues, 
that affected black and brown communities or low income communities, that they were supportive of tax uh, tax cuts for the ultra wealthy and the belief of trickle down economics that never worked for the majority of us. They were wrong on the crime bill. And now we have really transformed the party. And it's been so much of young people doing that. Um, and that's, I think, why they're starting to, the Demo Democratic Party is in large part winning is because they are being bolder. They are being more true to who the party should actually serve. So I think you already sort of answered that or at least spoke to this question. But I, I really want to really um, just clarify or, or really give you a chance to really um, just discuss this a little bit more. There is a sort of history of Democrats doing stuff and they don't get credit politically, electorally, they don't get credit, right? Like, you know, um, like um, financial relief during the COVID crisis or even managing and, and the rollout of the vaccine program, right? There's, things happen and, you know, Donald Trump would sign, you know, write checks and sign his name on them, right? And Joe Biden wouldn't do that because, you know, it's not appropriate. There, there's been this history of an inability to capitulate or capitalize, sorry, capitalize on our accomplishments Suddenly you have the, the passage of student debt relief, you have the Inflation Reduction Act and the climate provisions. When you talk to people, is it clear to them who is, why those, those um, pieces of legislation that debt that relief happened? Is, is Joe Biden, are the Democrats getting the credit or is it still a salesman job that, that Democrats need to improve on? Oh, I think Democrats still need to really improve on selling what they've won and delivered for the American people. And also what I really appreciated when the student debt relief happened, I feel like a lot of time Democrats have won something and then not been prepared to defend their win. So or capitulate uh, when Republicans start to attack them. I loved the just common facts about PP loans that uh, forgiveness that like uh, Congresswoman Major Marjorie Taylor Greene got and many others that they said, hey, don't there's a double standard here we're actually investing in the american people you just want to invest in yourself and we have to remind people of that you know i got asked on another program well, what do you say that this is a giveaway for votes and i was like i know republicans are probably confused but this is called democracy since they no longer believe in it but you make a campaign <laughs> promise and then you deliver and people vote for you for that. And that that is what happened here. And so um, I think we just have to hold our ground and own our wins um, and not concede any ground when, when our elected officials are doing what's right and delivering for the American people. Yeah. And just to just to piggyback off that, I think the CBO, the Congressional Budget Office, just came out and estimated that it was going to cost uh, the government like four hundred billion dollars or something, the student debt relief. And I was like, Man, that you know, that's a pittance compared to the one point nine trillion dollar tax giveaway that the you know, that it looks like it's going to cost us over the course of a decade that the Republicans gave to rich people, you know, like super rich people in um, in 2017. I mean, we're going to we are all going to be paying for that for, you know, this tax giveaway to the super wealthy. Um, and that exactly. costs one point nine trillion dollars. That's the projected cost of that uh, bill. And I don't think it did. You know, does anybody remember like suddenly there were more jobs or, you know, people were, <laughs> like the lower classes, the middle classes were doing better because I sure don't after that one. And so, you know, I, I'd gladly take this four hundred billion dollar um, you know, transformational piece for um, particularly for younger voters and younger voters of color. And and that's going to do far more for the economy over time than that um, tax giveaway to the rich did. No, I think but that's the issue, Christina, that's the issue, though, right? Like it, th this was relief for young brown and black um, kids and, and young adults. Right. That that may be why they were so offended. I mean, I think ultimately they have no interest in serving like working in middle class America. I think that's very clear. And I think Carrie brings up a really good point, which is what we need to own is we believe you build a strong economy by investing in the working and middle class of this country. They believe you build a strong economy for their very rich uh, friends and Wall Street and big corporations by making us all pay for it. And so I think we just have to own and say, look, we believe that investing in America's young people and their educational success is the best investment we can make to build a strong economy. That right. 
every uh, college graduate puts in close to $250,000 more into local taxes in their economy that they'll pay over their lifetime. That's a huge investment that having uh, an entire generation strapped with student debt where one in five student debt borrowers pre-COVID were already in default on their student loans does nothing except for big financial institutions. Um, and that lastly, I think we should start to get to a place where we say, you know, it used to be a wild idea in this country that there would be free public education K through 12. Uh, but then we decided it would help accelerate our economy and country. And so we invested in free K through 12 education. Um, maybe it's about time that we developed a K through higher education program that's tuition free in this country, because what a high school diploma was back then is what a college degree is today. Mm -hmm. Oh, no, that's crazy talk, Christina. That's crazy talk. <laughs> too crazy, too uh, crazy. I mean, radical. Hey, which states are you in? Uh, uh, next gen, which states are you in? So we are the country's largest youth voting rights organization. We are in eight battleground state this, uh, states um, this election cycle, focusing on mobilizing 9.6 million likely progressive voters that are under the age of 35 this election. Yeah, I mean, it's it's going to be, we're going to see, it, I mean, I, we keep talking about how the battleground states are, are, they're all the presidential battleground states. It's the exact same ones, right? It's Arizona, Georgia, Florida, North Carolina, Pennsylvania, Michigan, Wisconsin. And um, and so the organizing we're doing now actually also carries into 2024, but it also means that every one of those races is going to be a 50-50 race. And Republicans are doing everything they can to give us a, a, an extra boost in places like, like Georgia and, and Pennsylvania and Arizona, but it's the youth vote is going to be decisive in those states. So the work that you guys are doing is absolutely incredibly important and might even be determinative of the final outcome. So I'm, I'm sort of curious. Um, we've seen Tom Bonnier and Target Smart talk about how probably about half of new voter registrations are under the age of 25, which is just a mind blowing number in its own right. You guys are specifically getting people registered to vote. So I'm curious what you guys are seeing and what may have, what it looked like before Dobbs and what it looks like now. I mean, before Dobbs, it was it, it was a little rough out there. You know, there was a lot of people that were not very motivated about the election. It was like a midterm, um, especially for new voters. They're like, I just voted in 2020 or I've never voted. Why am I going to vote in this election? Um, and it was a hard sales pitch. And now it's been a flood, not just to next gen, but across states um, where you're seeing huge, huge surge in numbers. So we've actually pivoted a lot of our pivoted a lot of our work, not just to registration, but to start to capture that energy, that organic energy that's coming from young people and making sure they know when, where to vote, where their polling location is. Um, and, and make sure they know who to vote for as well, because we have a huge opportunity, not just to focus on the Senate and House, but really key races for Secretary of State races you talked about the 2024 election. Um, we have election deniers that are biting, biting for positions to over to certify elections, and we need to make sure they don't get elected and that young people go all the way down ballot. And in seven of these eight states, Republicans have also gotten rid of straight ticket voting because they understand that straight ticket voting um, had helped folks that were newer voters, um, especially younger voters, cast ballots for Democrats. So in seven of these eight states, no longer straight ticket voting, we have to get people to go all the way down the ballot. And is there is do you have like I mean, numbers? I, on, on, can yeah, I yeah. Say, can I just <laughs> say, if Republicans can find a way to like screw over voters, they will find it. I mean, like they just like, it's just everything like, no, you can't do straight ticket. Now you got to go all the way down, you know, no, there's not drop boxes. No, you know, no, we're not, well, you know, my home state mail, yeah. like we've seen a big surge in states of young people participating through vote by mail as it got expanded through the pandemic. Of course, sure. they don't want that. So, yeah. and then we always talk about in my home state of Texas, you can't even vote by mail unless you're um, a senior citizen. So it's already disqualifies younger voters from participating in the most uh, popular way for people to vote. Yeah. So Texas is one of the states that has, uh, one of the pioneer states in outlawing abortion actually. And yet it's got this <laughs> core progressive majority that, you know, doesn't have power for reasons of disenfranchisement, uh, some apathy, some you know, uh, maybe some other historical reasons. 
is there any chance that Democrats will make up some ground and maybe be you know competitive or, or even potentially win some of these statewide elected offices in Texas? This is this is your home turf, so I'm sure yeah, you know this very like, well. I was just taking nope. my soapbox right now to talk. No about No pressure. That. <laughs> I mean, what people need to understand about Texas and why I'm so excited that next gen and to have have the privilege to lead this job is that, yes, we on every single issue that you can possibly imagine in this country about which way the wind blows on climate change, on immigration, on policing, um, on education, on abortion. A lot of that comes home here to Texas, not just because of our size, but because of the role we have played um, organizing other attorney generals in the country. Um, but I think what you need to understand are first our demographics. And then I want to say demographics are not destiny. They are simply a core ingredient in the recipe for change, but not change itself. So, you know, people, I'm half white, half Mexican. I think people think a lot of people like when they think of Texas, like my white grandpa who lived in Houston and wore a cowboy hat and fringe jacket. But really our state is majority young, brown and black. So in Texas, 67% of those under the age of 18 are people of color. 67% of those wow. over age 65 are white. So uh, it's the fifth largest racial generation gap in the country, an older population that looks very different than its younger population. Um, uh, we are the third youngest state in the country. Only Utah and Alaska are younger than Texas. So if you wanna change Texas, you have to invest in young people and young people of color. And the other thing is you have to do that over cycles. Like Georgia didn't change overnight. Georgia changed because there was a concerted effort over a decade when no one believed Georgia could change to invest in communities, especially communities of color and young people and build up their electoral power and make the electorate match the actual population. So that's what we're part of a project that we're all part of. Beto is helping accelerate that. Um, he's very popular with young people. He took 71% of the youth vote when Ted Cruz, uh, when he ran against Ted Cruz. Um, and then um, this election, we've already seen a big, big surge, especially in young people registering. And he lost by close to like, you know, 220,000 votes to Ted Cruz in 2018. Every year in Texas, 411,000 young people turn 18, of which the majority are people of color. And so that's the power that I'm investing in um, and that we're investing in as those young people of color. Yeah, 200,000 seems like a big number in absolute numbers, but for the size of Texas as a percentage, I think it was only about 2 or 3%, right? I mean, it's like definitely... Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, it's definitely within the the margin of, of, a, of a shift if that turnout is there. Uh, in addition to suburban voters and all the other sort of transitioning or swing voters in, in the state. So are you feeling, how are you feeling about our chances then in Texas? You know, I feel like we live in this political moment where all, no matter what state you're in, you've got to fight it out. And this is where I think Democrats, especially like on polls, we got to keep fighting no matter what the polls say, because polls have let us down in the past and mobilize our base um, and focus on making sure that everyone we know gets out and vote. Um, in Texas, look, Republicans are scared. They are scared because they know the numbers are not on their side. Um, that's why they've played many dirty tricks in our state to try and hold on to power. Th they have tried, we have had one of the lowest voter turnout rates of any state in the country. Mm -hmm. So if you drive up turnout, you win in Texas. So I'm of the belief that I'm going to fight until the last election day um, and that Beto is our best bet to win against um, Republicans. And Carrie said at the beginning, like right now, Republicans have gone so far and so out of step with the vast majority of the American public. And they're even out of step with tech, like the electorate of Texas on abortion, on guns. Like they're so, so far yeah. out of step <clears throat> and people are seeing that. Yeah. Um, we're, Almost out of time, um, Christina, I'm, I'm curious if you could, sh you know, you shared earlier a story about, you know, what what student debt relief meant to to one individual you were talking to. And I just I love those stories. Do you have a couple more you could share with us? Just people who, who are inspired to vote because of what the Democrats have done uh, recently? Yeah. You know, um, I think of uh, this young woman. Um, Jackie Duque, who I know, who goes to UT Austin, she's like 21. Both of her parents are undocumented, but she's a US citizen. And she, yesterday she was just texting me and she's like, I need to check my registration status. Um, I need to make sure that I'm voting and I need the information so I can get my my other friends to vote because we're oh, really perfect. mad about what we've seen happening. Um, and so there are like 
I think there's the, the surge, especially of young women, but then there's also folks like she also benefited from student debt cancellation. So people see both, again, what we're up against and what's what's possible. Um, and so I think there are so many stories like that across the country that the, we're seeing that big, big surge of young people. And remember, this isn't just about this election. This is about capturing them for long term yeah, electoral exactly. power. And the other last thing I want to say about the youth vote that's important for us is older progressives or uh, with years of wisdom behind us is that young long in the tooth. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> right. Yeah. Um, young voters are staying more progressive. Like there's always been a theory that young people, as they get older, they become more conservative. Um, but older millennials are also staying very progressive. Um, and they're more progressive on the economy. They're more progressive on race and they're more progressive um, on LGBTQ issues. And this is in part because young people are more diverse. Right. And so that they see their interests are not aligned with a Republican party that looks very different like than the rest of America or their generation. Can I just ask one last question that just occurred to me? Did on the student loan thing, I mean, sometimes, you know, Democrats do something and they're like, no one knows about it. I mean, it sounds like what you're seeing is that a lot of voter, youth voters really do know about, you know, student debt relief. I don't know if they know about the environmental package uh, passed, you know, but like, do you think do you think there's a high awareness of some of these things or higher awareness of one than the other? I, I, just... think, I think that people know, but they don't know exactly what's included. So we did a student debt celebration event at a campus. And I would say that half of the people had no idea whether they qualified or not. Um, and so that was like a big piece is we need to make sure that people understand who's impacted how they're impacted and what they can do to benefit. And the same with the Inflation Reduction Act. People understand generally that it's a big win, um, but they have no idea what's included or how it's going to impact their lives and make their lives better. So I, we have a lot more. I think we've started to do a lot better job on the Democratic side of doing two things, owning our wins, but also talking about the other side more clearly. One thing I do really appreciate about the Biden administration is we've gotten past that place of like, we're all going to come together and sing Kumbaya. Um, <laughs> oh God. Yeah. And then like, no, honestly, there are some people that don't want to be part of this American project with us and they yeah. want to create an Island to themselves. And that's not what we're building. Um, and so I think being very clear about what we're up against and what we're for has been a big step. I've seen us make just in the last couple of months, but we've got to continue to do it a lot better. So, Christina, how can people help you and NextGen accomplish its mission to mobilize youth voters in this critical election, not just in November, but moving ahead? Um, Marcos, thank you for asking that question. Um, people can go to nextgenamerica.org forward slash volunteer. So we have an army online. We've built um, 25,000 volunteers, which I think is like actually now closer to 30,000. And we're trying to nice. continue to build it up um, for this election. But last election, our volunteers helped us make close to 30 million texts, uh, millions of phone calls, organized on Twitch and video games. And um, we have expanded our dating app organizing program. Whoa. Yeah, um, which we're not catfishing people, but <laughs> and, uh, we're talking about what we say is the big D, democracy. Um, <laughs> um, but we're talking to people because you can search by geography and age and we're just talking to young people about whether they're registered, what their voting plan is this election. So no matter where you are, you can organize with us. No matter your age, you can organize with us, though. If you're a little older, we would suggest not the dating apps, but some of the other online organizing that we do. Um, and like I said, our 25,000 volunteers helped put in $4 million in sweat equity last election to help us have the largest youth voter turnout in American history. And the URL once again was? Nextgenamerica.org forward slash volunteer or just go to nextgenamerica.org. Christina, thank you so much for joining us. Love the work that you do. Love you. And it's amazing. And I'm excited about this, <laughs> this opportunity we have in November that we shouldn't have. But Republicans have really opened up the door to, to um, really show what they are all about and what threat they pose. They're not hiding it anymore. There's no dog whistles. It's all out in the open. Supreme Court's already, you know, gotten rid of abortion. So it's up to us now. And, and there's no ambiguity. So well, thank you for giving us space to talk about what's at stake this election and the power that young voters have to change it. And also for being a partner and helping us recruit thousands of volunteers to use their volunteer muscle to 
shift the outcome this election. Yeah, Daily Coast loves next gen. Thank you so much. And uh, yeah, uh, looking forward to talking to you soon, hopefully to celebrate good Let's stuff happening this November. Oh, Thanks so much. Great.